your weekend. Good. You're still, you're still standing. Well, you're not standing. You're sitting. Uh, I'm going to start a couple minutes early for a couple reasons. One is that I just learned that I don't, I don't have the entire hour because of something coming here right at two o'clock. So we have to finish a little bit before two. And my presentation was was running close to an hour, and I was hoping to leave a little bit of time for for Q and A or questions or complaints or you know whatever you might have at the end. Uh, and they have some stuff to give away too, and I thought we'd do it before before we start, uh, just because uh, we have a couple minutes before the official start time. So how many people here uh, do play D and D or some other role playing game? Okay, I'm all of you. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't need to explain. I'm speaking to preaching to the to the converted here. Uh, well, I have some. I have a Wizards of the Coast very kindly gives me some some junk. So this is maybe something you can. You can uh, pass on to your offspring, or perhaps your girlfriend or boyfriend. Um, and to give this one away, I'll just ask a really easy trivia question. Uh, and the, the way this works is if you just raise your hand rather than shouting out the answer, because if more than one person shouts out an answer, then I'm going to have to give you this <laughs> to settle the, the debate. So just raise your hand. I'll try to, I'll try to go to the first person who, who raises their hand. Uh, this is a sort of a two-part question. It's sort of an advanced one. Uh, what I'm looking for is the year Dungeons and Dragons was invented and the names of both of the founders. This gentleman, I think, is first. 1974. Yes. Gary Gygax and Dave Aronson. Very good. Very good. 1974. Very good. Uh, the second thing I'm going to give away a copy of my book, uh, now available in paperback for $14.95. Uh, for uh, maybe I'll this is a this is more of a Lord of the Rings question, but again, an easy one for most geeks here. But we'll see how you do. Uh, looking for uh, you know the fellowship goes into the mines of Moria, and uh, it's a password they need to uh, ask at the gate. Do you know the password in English and in Elvish? <laughs> I got this hand up. It's uh, in English, it's friend. In Elvish, it's mellow. Mellow, very good. Something like that. Excellent. Good job. <laughs> All right. See you afterwards. I'll, I'll put my I'll put my Gary guy gas on that. Uh, All right. Well, let's let's just start because it is exactly two o'clock. I mean, one o'clock, whatever time it is. Thank you so much for for. Coming to my little event, my little pep talk, my little therapy session, um, and this is this is a, a presentation that I've given in a couple different forms and ways before. And like I said, I'm going to try to speed through it because um, uh, we have a little less time than I thought we did. But I want to start out by just getting start to think about what are the secret powers of storytelling? Why why do we need escape? What is it about our culture that is perhaps something that's missing in our culture that necessitates some need for fantasy for a game like Dungeons and Dragons? Can Dungeons and Dragons save your life? So this is a story about my, my personal journey, um, but hopefully it will resonate with you about sort of my transformation from moaner, werewolf, to geeky comrade, from introvert to extrovert, from sort of a self-conscious, klutzy spaz to a somewhat more confident, hopefully semi-professional person. I mean, I'm still a klutzy spaz, don't get me wrong. It's just that I'm more comfortable with that role. Um, and I don't know if, if D&D has, has affected you in the same way it's affected me, um, but perhaps it will come to help you sometime in the future. Um, or at the very least, maybe after listening to this talk and, and thinking about some of the issues we, we, we covered today, you can better explain who you are and why you love the game uh, to your confused parents or your skeptical spouses or loved ones. Um, and, you know, tell them why you really love gaming. And of course, we play games because why? Well, because they're fun. That's the obvious reason. Uh, because we like to do things together in a social way. And, and that's, you know, the obvious answer. But, but I think there's something more to it, for me anyway. I think that the game has a real transformative power. Um, so I'm gonna uh, punctuate my, my talk here with this, the slides here, which I don't know how the resolution is gonna work out yet, but I, 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 part of my story is that I discovered all my little Dungeons and Dragons stuff in a box in my parents' basement. I had 
hadn't seen in 25 years. So a lot of the images you'll see are actual, genuine stuff from back in the day. Um, so D&D, uh, D&D uh, &D saved my life. That's what I like to say. Maybe you can save yours. It's not too late. <laughs> so um, here's the here's the game. This is the this is the box set that I played with um, back in the day. A little beat up as you can tell. And here's me. Here's a kid. Uh, it's uh, late 1970s or early 1980s, in the middle of the wilds of rural New Hampshire, and I'm bored, and I'm introverted, and I'm shy, and um, not a member of any team. Definitely not a guy's guy. Kind of by myself. Uh, did not have a girlfriend. Uh, girls were not to be spoken to. Um, and uh, and I had a problem with that. Uh, but a, a couple cool things happened in the late 70s. Who here was alive in the 1970s? All right, a few here. Two things happened in 1977. The movie on the top of the left of your screen, Star Wars, came out. So that's me in New Hampshire. In the, there's two sons in New Hampshire. I don't know if you knew that. You just went down the road and two sons. Um, so I saw, I saw Star Wars in 77 when I was uh, 11 years old. I saw it in the movie theater. And, uh, it changed my life in a really gloomy way. And the second was this movie, uh, the first Lord of the Rings adaptation by Ralph Bakshi, which came out in 1978. And I became inspired. I wanted to be a creator. I wanted to be a filmmaker. I, I bought myself a Super 8 movie camera. I started to draw a lot of pictures. I read a lot of books. I really started to dream, and I wanted to become this storyteller. Um, but the problem was uh, that to be an artist, you have to sort of be a social person. And I was... Um, <laughs> I had very few social skills. Um, I was mistrustful of the world of adults. I was afraid of a lot of things. I was afraid of blood. These are some of the top things I was afraid of. And you can see that, um, well, high water pants. I mean, God, if you had high water pants and you were in high school, my high school boy. Uh, talking to adults on the phone, I was keeping one girls, and of course getting a boner in gym class. That was the ultimate fear. Uh, so I was afraid of a lot of things, and that was a problem. Uh, and also in 1978, something else happened, and that was, this is a picture of my mom. Um, in 1978, she was a student at Harvard getting her master's degree, and uh, she was 30 years old, and she had a brain aneurysm, which ruptured, uh, this is my only attempt to illustrate what that looks like. But those of you who don't know what a brain aneurysm is, it's a blood vessel in your brain, and if it ruptures, it causes a lot of brain damage. This is the last picture that uh, was ever taken of her before she became sick. And she survived it. She was in the hospital here in Boston in Mass General for about um, six months. But she came out a greatly transformed, changed woman. She was paralyzed on the left side of her body. She um, uh, couldn't speak as well. Her personality was changed. She was, for all intents and purposes, uh, a pretty brain damaged person. And as a kid growing up with this in my house, she came home from the hospital as a 12 year old. I was scared. I mean, I was scared of this. It's, adolescence is tricky enough for most of us to negotiate. And here was this, this creature who, as a kid, I found very intimidating. Um, my dad wasn't around much that, at that point. He was actually had, uh, divorced my mom a few years before this. So my brother and sister and I, we took care of my mom, we took care of her mom. And uh, we called mom the monster. Uh, and I grew up, I grew up. I grew up pretty fast, let's put it that way. Uh, but luckily, Dungeons and Dragons came to save me. This is the kid who taught me to play d, d He was kind of a misfit like me. Um, he was um, uh, moved across the street from me in 1979 in my small little town in New Hampshire. And he has a number of interesting uh, qualities, including he's about five feet tall, and he uh, has brittle bone disease. So every time he would you know, fall off his bike and break his arm or something like that. Well, JP taught me d, &D. This is now the game that been out for five years. This is 1979. And, um, you know, a new cultural phenomenon. Uh, and so uh, I started to play. And uh, I played every Friday night with him and some other guys that we connected with in middle school and high school. Um, every Friday from basically seventh grade till my senior year in high school. And I really, it was really the first time I found a group of guys to hang out with. And a, a sense of feeling I was part of something, part of a team. I was not ever going to be on a sports team. Here this was an experience where I got to be part of something. 
Um, and I recently, believe it or not, about six months ago, I was going through a pile of my old Super 8 movies um, that I'd shot. A lot of them were these claymation movies and monster movies and my versions of like Star Wars movies with my model aircraft carriers and airplanes that I had like broken apart and reassembled into spaceships and dangled from fishing wires and, you know. But I also remember I had a birthday party and apparently I took this movie uh, of us back in the day. So this is an actual footage uh, of a DV session from 1981. There we are, there's JP. Um, and this was an amazing find. This was a huge, there's the dice, of course. I think I said to my friend John, roll a die now, okay. <laughs> uh, there's Dean. Uh, and again, this is another guy, Eric. We had three guys, two guys named Eric and three guys named Bill who played with us. I don't know why that was the <laughs> There's my cat Marley, there's my, this is my living room. And, uh, you know, of course, you know when you play a character in Dean, you get to be someone who you're not. And I think this was my first experience of getting to try out, you know, parts of my personality and really express myself, become sort of a fledgling actor. Uh, there's me in the middle, by the way. Uh, and now we've done some stop motion stuff. Woo! At some point, there's a there's a shot of a can of, of, of Mountain Dew. I'm not kidding you. <laughs> there's a module. Somebody saw this video on YouTube and they said, "I know that module. It was the the fire giant module G3 or something." Like that. Anyway, anyway, so we played a lot of D and D, and we spent a lot of time in in, in living rooms and basements, like typical geeks. Uh, spend a lot of time in our bedrooms playing with our <laughs> dice. <laughs> we did our time in the dungeon. Um, and uh, I think I think one of the important lessons for me at the time was this idea that you know you didn't have to be part of a clique or you know be part of a popular crowd or whatever just to just to be able to have fun with your friends as long as you find them. Once you find people that you 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 dig, who get your who dig your language. Uh, you can uh, you can have a good time. I think we're eating birthday cake. It's pretty hard. There, do you see that? That was it. That was that was the can do. All right, this is only about two minutes long, so it should be, should be much longer. The other thing that uh, was interesting was at this time. I don't know if you recall, or for those of you who are old enough, this was the time when Dungeons and Dragons was a feared cultural phenomenon. It came shortly after comic books, shortly before rap music, shortly before. Uh, right, this, around the time the video games actually, we played a lot of video games in those days as well. They weren't super violent. But um, D&D was, you know, supposedly going to teach us Satanism and Satanic practices, and it was going to uh, turn us into devil worshippers, and we'd be suicide prone. Um, and of course, uh, that didn't happen, but that didn't uh, stop us from playing, and they just actually wanted to play even more. Uh, here we are again, this is a senior year of high school on the exit end. We look pretty awesome there. <laughs> uh, um, so this is actually an article uh, that came out. Uh, the one on the left is from a college newspaper in another town, but the one in the down on the lower right is D and D taking over Kaufman Home. Yes, the local paper sent a journalist to our D and D club and <laughs> wanted to find out what this D and D thing was all about. You know, were we listening to Judas, Judas Priest and were we were we summoning demons in our in our bowls of, of, of Doritos? Um, <laughs> and it, of course, that didn't happen. <laughs> Uh, it was that, but you know, this, this, this of course made us feel a little bit badass. It was like, oh, we're doing something that not only no one really knows about, but it's kind of cool and bad to be doing it. Um, but as I mentioned before, I was still, I was still a, a pretty shy, socially inept kid, and so I found myself starting to work out some of my real world stuff in the game, uh, because you know, basically, you can tell from my life to this point, it's not all violence and you know sad songs, but you know, life had sort of taught me that the adult world was kind of unpredictable and weird things could happen, and the, the rules of adulthood were completely arbitrary. And here at least, there was a game that we had a rule book. We didn't know the answer to something because we, we could look it up. Um, you know, I couldn't slay the monster, my mom, uh, obviously, but metaphorically, you know, I could role play a wizard, uh, I could charge into battle with my plus two longsword. Uh, who needs varsity sports when you can shoot fireballs from your fingertips? So D and D let me feel powerful, and part of that power is, of course, the power trip of creating your own world. And this is um, a little hard to read. Them. My apologies, but this is uh, you know, as you know, as a DM, you get to make your world and you make your map. You know, I was of course a huge Tolkien fan, so I was ripping off Tolkien left and right. 
And uh, you know, there's the power of being the DM and, and of course bringing your friends to adventures and hopefully almost killing them off, but not quite, or maybe killing them off first. We had one game where one of the players was an assassin and went assassinating the other players. Not a cool thing, but to a 16-year-old boy, that's exactly what you wanted to do. Uh, <laughs> uh, so this anyway, this is one of the maps of one of the worlds that came up. But I remember the can you see that pointer there? Sort of visible? Not really, no. Anyway, there's some place names here, it's a little hard to read. I have some very original um, original place names. There's the Silver Lake, there's the Green Hills, there's the Lizard Lake, there's the Dark Woods. And then, you know, down in the lower corner in Middle Earth, of course, it's the land of the evil land of Mordor. Well, in my world, I don't know if you can read it, but it's the evil, dangerous, mysterious land of evil called Bangor. <laughs> Apparently, I don't make the connection to the name that name had been taken. Uh, and as you know, the DM has to come up with, with the backstories for their worlds. And this is actually something I typed myself on an electric typewriter using whiteout, or those little pieces of whiteout paper. Remember those things you would stick in there? And this is on onion skin paper. I don't know if you remember this stuff. Uh, this is some histories of, of, of this land, this map I just showed you. Uh, we have the Barrens. The Barrens is this, this is this area of land is a long, brown, dead stretch of land. It is useless. A river curse has been placed upon it, which might have created the desolation. Seems plausible. Um, in my short history of the Forgotten Plains, I say the place is so far north and secluded that, quote, no one knows anything worth about them, thus are forgotten. So you don't need to be a psychologist to figure out <laughs> the not so subtle parallels between what I'm doing in my DD world and what's happening in my real world. And also, I, I was, to be fair, I was listening to a lot of the Whisper Cult and watching that R rated heavy metal movie about a hundred times when it came on cable. Uh, so a lot, of my, a lot of my lands were barren, waste, you know, barren places with, where no, no one lived, except for, of course, studly guys that I would like to be, and of course, girls in chain Hill Keys. <laughs> um, and in fact, if you read the, the history at the bottom, the fourth one up from the bottom, the Lord Search Plains, it says, these huge fertile lands have been fought over recently by Kameo and Narna, and some of it has been destroyed. Camel <laughs> or female? Nor what is it? Nor Norna or Norma? I think I kind of wish that Camel and Norma were fighting over me. I don't know. Um, this is one of my favorite characters. This is on the three ring binder of this paper. This is Lord Elrond. And again, I think you can, you can see this. Now, the real world, Ethan, at this point, my stats were definitely all below 10. But Lord Elrond. Who was, I can't figure out what level he is at this point, but he's got 18s, 17s, and 16s. Uh, he's got uh, 99 hit points. There's hit points. He's got uh, plus three frost brand. He's got a war horse. You can't really read this, but he's got war horse, and he's also got uh, 40 days of horse food. <laughs> um, and there's something called a giant, this giant, giant falcon, which is helpful, and a bird of warning. This is down in the the magical areas, I think, somewhere down here. And there's also something called the periapt of wound closure. Now, periapt is like an amulet you wear on your neck. So wouldn't it have been nice to have a word of warning in my real life or have something that could close the wounds of my life or my mother's life, perhaps? At the very top, you can barely read it. There's something I scribbled in pencil. It says the filter of love, P-H-I-L-T-E-R. It would be nice to have one of those as well. Well, a funny thing happened. Whoops. I'm just saying, there we go. Oh, it's gone. I was going to show you my awesome dungeon really quickly. Sorry. This is my favorite dungeon of all time. This is called um, uh, Merc Island. Where is it? And the Crypts of Doom, I believe it's called. Uh, which I mean, you can imagine may or may not have been inspired by my years of. of uh, Listening to Iron Maiden. It's a 230 foot high tower with horns on the top. <laughs> with sort of a penal like staircase that runs up the middle. <laughs> anyway, I think Iron Maiden they really wrote me off on that one. So, a funny thing happened on the way through the dungeon, and that was that I sort of became a bit more of a, you know, kind of come, come out of my shell a bit. Um, I began to become a little more confident, uh, a little more brave. I started to make my own efforts of writing fiction, as probably many uh, of you might have tried, and certainly I did. 
was my efforts to write my own epic fantasy trilogy. I usually didn't make, make it past page three, but anyway. Uh, this is the beginning of my, of my version of, of what I thought Lord of the Rings uh, by Ethan would be. And check out that illuminated S in the shape of a dragon. It's pretty, it's pretty awesome. Uh, Such as it was in the beginning, coldness and darkness, but out of the night sprung life. How it came to be can only be known by the gods themselves, but the life brought goodness and light. Things grew everywhere, trees and plants, and creatures of all sorts abounded. Living things existed and prospered in peace and harmony. Aww. <laughs> so the barren wastelands of my angsty adolescence are starting to be replaced by possibly more fertile imagery. Out of the night sprung life. That wasn't the only thing springing to attention. Uh, I was becoming more social. This is my high school yearbook, my senior year, 1984. I wasn't just a heroic warrior in game, I was a warrior in the real world. I was president of the AV club. <laughs> and I actually started to act in some school plays, if you can possibly believe it. Um, and I got a girlfriend. <laughs> she looked a lot, I couldn't find her photo, but she looked pretty much like this. Uh, but honestly, I, I, did, I did somehow, the, the fall of my senior year, sort of screw up the courage to ask a girl out, and she said yes. And then I actually kissed her, which was the first time I kissed a girl, senior year in high school, I can't believe it. Um, and uh, she didn't always have to wear this chain like me. Um, so I was, I was starting to feel more confident and, and, and a bit more uh, you know, able to to do this risky, for me, risky activity. And something else happened that I thought was interesting I just share with you. I was going through that pile of stuff that I was telling you about, my boxes of DVD. And this is, again, I don't know if you can read this, but I started to scribble down notes of, of a game that I wanted to create. I don't know if you had this experience playing DVD, DVD but after several years, you'd be like, I, I'm done with this DVD thing. And these other games are not any good. I'm going to make my own game. <laughs> I'm going to make my own rules, right? So I started to just brainstorm about what my new game was going to be like. Uh, the new idea, serious, fun, playability, interesting, stimulation, realistic, and then oh, want to play for real. I'm not sure what that means, but <laughs> it's, a little, it's a little scary. Um, well, I never, I never really became a game designer, uh, and as it turned out, I, I stopped playing D&D after high school, and I'll tell you the end of that story at the end of this talk, but, but I think that, you know, D&D gave me a real important place to, to park myself for a few years and to, to escape to kind of regroup, become uh, uh, stronger, uh, more, more skillful in a social way. And uh, by the time I graduated, went to college and off to a small alternative liberal arts school in western Massachusetts um, called Hampshire College. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, started my artistic career, at least what I thought was going to be an artistic career, being a, being a, a filmmaker and a writer. Uh, did grad school and started to, you know, branch out and do stuff. My first job, I remember, was actually working for Hampshire College, recruiting uh, for the admissions office. I mean, it was literally driving around the country, talking to high school kids, trying to get them to come to this hippie school in Western Mass. Um, and I worked in a small um, uh, bookstore in, in southern Vermont, in Rockford, Vermont, and where I was the assistant manager. I started doing all these, all these jobs, and I really feel like, at the end, it sort of draw the connections between all the things that I learned and, 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 and skills that I had gotten from d and and what I was doing in the real world, and it occurred to me that you know, there's not that much difference between running some kind of Dungeons and Dragons campaign and running your own small business, or running a marketing campaign, or uh, organizing, I don't know, a youth t-ball league, or you know, any number of things that you have to do that require all that uh, level of, of organization. So I, I kind of came up with a list of things that you know you might do in the D&D world that could apply in the real world. So you go to the tavern, start an adventure, and you, you find your party. It's a lot like, you know, networking, social networking, finding your team, your team of coworkers at the water cooler, at the bar. Uh, anytime you're mapping on the fly, which we all do when we're playing D&D, it's a kind of metaphorical uh, way to think about how you navigate on the fly. Without your Garmin or without your GPS, I mean literally mapping, literally or figuratively. Uh, you're creating stories and plots and backstories in the game world. Uh, in the real world, you're writing business plans, you're writing press releases, you're writing annual reports. Uh, narrative that you create as a, as a DM to engage your players, to get them excited about this world, this realistic world, this highly detailed realistic world, is the same thing that you do just in, 
in your social engagement with people. You're, you're talking to them, you're getting your, your coworkers excited about what you're doing, you're getting your family excited about what you're doing. Uh, that time you negotiated with the kobolds or the town mayor, or that lich. Well, maybe the negotiation with the lich didn't go so well, but um, you are doing the same thing when you're negotiating with your boss uh, or business foe. Uh, executing any kind of long battle or raid is the same skills you would use to tackle any long campaign project in the real world, dealing with administration, some kind of institution. Um, I thought that the, the metaphor of finding treasure and getting experience points is a lot like getting paid and getting raising money and going up a level in real life. And then the equivalent of killing stuff is just, I guess, succeeding, right? <laughs> um, the other thing I learned about, um, I don't know if you guys know this book, The Elements of Style. It's a grammar guide, some of you may have read it. People, a lot of people think that uh, Strunk and White wrote it. But actually, um, I found a version of this written by Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson. And I thought I'd share with you some, some lessons that I felt D&D had taught me uh, for grammar, uh, grammar lessons. So this is a little grammar exercise that I'll do with you. Uh, the first is to conjugate the verb to be. It says repeat after me, but you don't actually have to. Uh, I am an elf. You are an elf. He is an elf. Is she an elf? We are all elves, dwarves, and halflings. I really hope she is an elf. There are too many he elves around here. <laughs> Verb tense practice. The simple present. I have five pounds of dice. Simple past. I killed 47 orcs. Conditional. If I had known your mom couldn't drive you, I would have brought the pizza myself. <laughs> if I had known, I would have brought that's the conditional. Uh, present perfect. Ethan has played D&D every Friday night for five years straight. Future perfect. By senior year, Ethan will have kissed a girl. <laughs> a real one. <laughs> All right, open your Dungeon Master Guide to uh, Dungeon Master's Guide to page 123. This is actually in your Dungeon Master's Guide. Use any of the following prostitute phrases in a sentence. <laughs> Slovenly troll, troll, sorry, cheap trollop, saucy tart, wanton witch, expensive doxy, aged madam, rich panderer, brazen strumpet. Repeat, till exhausted. You guys remember that, that wandering, like, wandering chart of prostitutes in the DM's guide? Those guys are having a lot of fun. I don't think that's in 4.0. Um, <laughs> Conjunction, uh, conjun conjunctions. Remember the conjunction, junction, what's your function? For those of you who can remember. So there are coordinated conjunctions. These words include and, but, or, not, for, and yet. Use them in a sentence. Sentence number one. I became ill by eating Cheetos and drinking all the dew. <laughs> so that's using and in the sentence. Number two. The dungeon master had promised to not kill us, but he did not keep his promise. <laughs> so that's using but. And then um, the third one is using the word or. The jocks should have arrived or will be arriving soon to take our dice away. <laughs> All right, so much for the, the grammar lesson. This is the, D the Monster Manual, circa 1977. And you know, D&D teaches you a lot of things about life, teaches you a lot of things about grammar. We've already talked about that. Um, and. I think it can be inspirational in a creative way. It can inspire you to, to, to do great things. And uh, I was always inspired by the, by the Monster Manual because they had really cool drawings like this. <laughs> if you remember, Zamia, she was a babe. And I almost was going to read a poem that I had written in, inspired by her, but instead, I have another poem I wanted to read for you, uh, inspired by this monster. <laughs> Which, there's no picture of it. Why? Why is there no picture of the Jelani's Cube? Because you can see it. So this is a, a kind of a poem I wrote recently that's about uh, imagining a, a certain um, a fictitious or semi-fictitious scenario involving a certain teenage boy who may or may not have lived about an hour earlier. Um, and um, if I use the term electric orchestra, does that mean anything to anyone? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I just want to make sure when I start to break out the song part, 
You're with me. Okay. <laughs> so this is called The Gelatinous Cure versus Laurie McClintock, who's the fictitious version of some girl who may or may not have existed. What are the moves of the gelatinous cube? Few. Undetected, invisible, pretty much a 10 by 10 block of jello. Gelatinous cubes are nearly transparent and are difficult to see, and thus surprise on 1 to 3. So says the Monster Manual, page 43. It's true and it rhymes. Look it up. <laughs> yeah, I like the idea of the cube waiting, eating time, hoping for lost damsels to blunder by in the dark, like me on the couch in my living room, waiting, hoping to be alone with Lori McClintock. The electric light orchestra plays on the turntable. You got me running, going out of my mind. You got me thinking that I wasted my time. Don't bring me down. No, 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 no. Ooh. <laughs> and the no's accompany the rising crescendo of cicadas outside in the sad after dark August of the Carter administration. <laughs> the gelatinous cube is silent. The gelatinous cube makes no move. The artist coughed out. On page 43, there is no picture of the gelatinous cube, just a blank space like my angsty ribcage, like that useless weapon between my legs, invisible to girls. The gelatinous cube is one of the scavengers not uncommon in dungeons, says page 43. As these monsters travel about, they sweep up metallic and other items which are indigestible to them. I want to sweep up and collect Lori McClintock and her necklace. Snare her earrings with my tongue, unlock that rusty chastity belt or gauchos, or whatever. I wonder what sort of breasts sprout under her sweater. Stalactites? Or stalagmites? <laughs> which is which? I scavenge her in the dungeon of my mind. You got me shaking, got me running away, you got me calling up to you every day, don't drag me down. No, 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 no. The gelatinous cube still makes no move wisely because if the gelatinous cube touches his opponent, a saving throw versus paralyzation must be made or the creature touched is anesthetized for 5 to 20 million rounds. Well, if you recall, the cube then surrounds the victim and secretes digestive fluids and digests a meal. Laura McClintock will be anesthetized. I want to secrete on her. Then <laughs> eat her. But next round, Lord, Lord McClintock fights back. Gelatinous cubes can be hit by all forms of weapons, page 43 declares, which, by which it means swords, axes, daggers, morning stars, pull arms. Just not electricity, fear, or holds. Alas, Lord McClintock's fearful electric hold isn't powerless, like it says on page 43. It devours me. All right, so much for the poetry. Um, I feel like D&D is crack. It's like crack for creative people. I feel like in my discussions with D&D players or people who used to play D&D, all of them are poets or musicians or artists or performers or they're running their own IT company. Uh, John Favreau, who directed Iron Man and Iron Man 2 and Elf and this movie, Cowboys vs. Aliens, this is a scene from the movie. Uh, 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 he said D&D, &D, and he actually said this, gave him a strong background in imagination, storytelling, and understanding how to create tone and a sense of balance. I think it's absolutely true. I think that um, it's really a great uh, a training ground. Um, and D&D &D does improve your life, according to the ADDJFS, which is the Academy of D&D and Junk Food Studies. D&D <laughs> can make you stronger, can make you faster, more confident, and more attractive to those of the opposite or the same sex, depending on. And this is measured in volts. You can see before and after. It's pretty dramatic. One thing that's cool about D&D is that uh, when I was playing, no one cool was playing it. Or they were, and then you didn't hear about it. Of course, we all know Stephen Colbert used to play D&D, and Mike Myers, and Robin Williams, and all those people. But 
But think of all the famous people who play DD now who are out there talking about it. Um, Vin Diesel, uh, NBA star Tim Duncan, and I recently discovered, for research purposes, <laughs> porn star Sasha Gray also plays DD. This is true. Um, in conclusion, what have we learned today? Uh, there's a lot of things that I feel like, I'm not going to go over this whole list, but I feel like since coming back to playing DD, because the part that, that the story that I haven't told you is that I stopped playing for 25 years, then I discovered my DD stuff in my parents' basement uh, around my 40th birthday. This is a, sort of the story that I write about in my book here. And it was really rediscovering that, and also the movie, as you saw, that really got me thinking about how this had affected me so much. And I really, I just really feel like this is a strong, this is a strong message about, about how DB for me anyway taught me about socializing, about how to be a leader, about how to be part of something bigger than yourself, a story, an epic, uh, a collective experience. You get to feel that you're part of this thing that I was dreaming of doing, which was like when you read Lord of the Rings, there's the cool fellowship. Well, I think I had my fellowship. Um, I was so interested in history and languages and cultures um, and religion, looking through the theme folio and the monster manual, what is this Greek god, what is this Norse mythology about? I would use that as a reference and that would get me curious about other things. Um, how to empathize with others, how to negotiate with other people, how to imagine other outcomes. Uh, in uh, DD players who are wonderful uh, at being scientists and being, I guess, you know, future imagining, imagining what the future of the planet might be like, um, politicians, uh, negotiators, how to solve problems think creatively. Um, also this idea that life is a kind of sort of skill, but there's also that element of chance. You never know what's gonna happen. Um, and blowing off steam, because you know, we, we don't live in a culture now, unfortunately, where if I have a, a dispute with my neighbor who lives next to me here in Somerville, I can't just beat the crap out of them with my foam rubber LARP sword, or with my regular sword, I can't do it. Uh, because we live in a civilized culture, and that's the strap upon, you cannot, you cannot do this, or you can, but you, there are consequences, and like you will go to jail. Uh, but we, I think we have, you know, hardwired in our DNA is this same desire to go beat the crap out of someone or something, uh, either with a foam rubber sword or figurative, or flip, you know, kind of metaphorically in a game like DD. And um, I think DD gives us that, that power to, uh, an opportunity to do that, to blow off steam. Um, other things, improvisational skills, how to use free time in a way that um, isn't necessarily just about uh, absorbing some existing narrative, right? A book or a movie or a video game, which I love, all these forms of media, but what about a form of entertainment that you have to create yourself? Um, and I think that's an important uh, part of what DD can be. And the other is that we don't really connect to nature and to magic and to the unknown that we, in the way that we used to. I think we, we all believe in the power of Google and the power of satellites and the power of science, um, and we don't believe in, in sort of the forces of nature anymore. We're not connected to them anymore. We don't plan for crops and we don't go, in, we don't go to bed at 5 o'clock when it gets dark out and we stay up all night. Uh, we're staring at our computer screen. So I think DD is a way to reconnect to the sort of older version of, of the human race. And of course, Pokemon Adventures. Um, so I feel like, uh, like a character in a DD game who sort of outfits, outfits himself as a newbie, as a level one person that gains experience and growth and mastery. Uh, you know, DD was sort of the tool that I used in my life to kind of help me emerge from my negative three cloak of invisibility, or whatever it was I was wearing during those days, um, to nurture me, to serve me well through all the different adventures that I've gone on in my 20s, in my 30s, in my 40s. Uh, and I, I make my living as a, as, a, as a freelance writer and a journalist and a teacher and a poet um, and uh, sort of run my own freelance writing business. And uh, I'm okay standing up here talking to you. I don't really worry about getting a boner in public anymore. <laughs> you know, I, not, not so much anymore. Um, anyway, this is the box. This is the box of stuff that I was telling you about earlier in that blue cooler. Uh, it was a Coleman candy cooler. I'd stuff. Someone had stuffed all my BB stuff into it at one point, sometime during after college, and it just disappeared. 
And then, like I said, I found it, uh, and took it all out, and, and went on this sort of archaeological, sort of, you know, psycho archaeological expedition, exploring this and, and this game, and how much it meant to me. Um, and um, in the past two or three years, I started playing it. It's really great. And that's the other sort of way I think that D&D has kind of saved me a second time, because I was kind of in a bad place in my life. And also, was moving to a new city, didn't have any friends, again, and D&D was the tool that allowed me to kind of connect with a new group of friends here in Austin, which is great. Um, and uh, Irony of Ironies, the guy I play D&D with now, uh, is that same guy, JP, who taught me how to play back in 1979. He's now my brother-in-law. His sister married my brother. Well, we're not really, that's, I don't know what that makes those brothers out of law, something, whatever that is, like, <laughs> our families are intermarried. Um, and so the game has really connected me to my, to my youth, but in a, in, a, in a good way. And uh, I have my dice bag here that I just, in that bag, it's just dice bag full of my dice. And these are the dice that, um, you can see they're a little worn out. <laughs> I don't know if you remember these, but those of you go back to the, from the early days, these original polyhedral dice that came in the five different colors, or six different colors, apparently were not made of a very hard material because they, they wore down pretty easily. Uh, but those are the ones, those are the dice that, that I rolled uh, today, uh, and it's, it's, it's been a long journey. Um, I mentioned just my last sort of note here I'll say before we start to wrap up, and if you have questions or anything here, you feel free to ask. Um, one thing that I think is great about D&D is that it really is, I think, to a certain extent, subversive and revolutionary. And I say that because we live in an age where we are asked to absorb and buy and consume and buy things and pay for experiences in order to have fun, you know? And I think that we, as much as I love computers and I'm married to my, Mac, my MacBook in a way and I'm married to my you know, iPhone in a way, um, so much of the way we, we interact with each other now is through screens and sort of indirectly. And there are very few opportunities we have left in life where we get together face to face and do stuff uh, across the table from each other, uh, not in, you know, through some filter or some medium like a, a screen. So DD is a kind of um, subversive in that way. It doesn't require any electricity, really, other than just keeping the lights on in the house. It doesn't require batteries, or it doesn't burn gas, or you know, consume fossil fuels. Uh, and um, it connects you. And obviously, there's a lot of you know, hand-crafted things. If you want to make a map, you know, you, the easy thing is just to get out a, pen, a pencil and get out your graphic and draw. Uh, there are current, you know, obviously, the technological tools that can help you. But the best way is just the old-fashioned way. And I think that. The most important thing about DD is that it helps us create our own stories and connects us to this past that we have had in the human race forever, which is that we would tell stories about ourselves and our exploits. You know, we'd sit around the campfire, we'd go to the pub in my imaginary romantic version of the Middle Ages or Ireland or wherever people still do this sort of thing. And you know, make your own music and tell your stories and sit around the fire. And I think that the DD has that power, you know, to really reconnect us to this part of our past, this part of who we used to be uh, as people before things like um, movies and television, and cable TV, and HBO, and Netflix. And you know, I'm not anti this, of course, when we're at a convention here, I would be, you'd, be, you'd be throwing rocks at me if I said, you know, go home and throw your video games out. I'm not saying that at all, but, um, you know, this is just a, a wonderful message to that other part of who we are. So, um, I saw this bumper sticker the other day. I want one out. Has anyone seen this here at the convention? Uh, I gotta get one of these. It says, we can't read, it says, I played D&D &D before it was cool. <laughs> um, so anyway, I, um, I, I don't want to imagine, you know, a world without heroes or a world without stories. Uh, a world where only corporate forces will teach us how to have a good time. And in that way, I think, you know, this is what makes D&D the most powerful thing of all. Um, and all you need is some dice and some graph paper and some pencils and the provisions of your choice. I prefer Cheetos <laughs> and Mountain Dew. Um, I do not like that. I don't understand the appeal of that. Um, and friends. That's the biggest important adventure. So uh, I wish you well in your adventures and um, I hope you always Thank you for saving bros. And um, <laughs> and thank you for thank you for listening to this and I'll see you I'll see you in the dungeon. Uh, we have a few more minutes if you want um, to ask a question.
or do we have a few minutes? We have a few minutes if people have a question or a comment or a complaint, or we can just, um, you know, sing me a low together. <laughs> yeah. I, I have a question. I, I also wanted to ask this, uh, I think it was yesterday, that before with the other panel that you yeah. um, I wanted to start playing D&D with my girlfriend and her two sisters, because uh, they seem interested in it, but they've never, they're not really gamers, and they've never really done any role playing at all. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm, I've explained it to them as though they have a lot of freedom, a lot of creativity that they can that they can make their character. There's a lot of freedom to do, you know, just to imagine what they can do. Yeah. Um, and I don't want to stifle any of their creativity, uh, but like they sometimes they say things like, "Oh, can I be God?" or like, right. "Can I be yeah. Satan?" Yeah. or like whatever. And I'm like, "Whoa!" whoa. Like, <laughs> there are some confines, but yeah. what, what's the best way to approach that? Because I, I want to try not to stifle their creativity, like. Yeah, I think I think you want to tap into their tap into their enthusiasm for sure, get excited about right, it. But right. I remember the same thing. Me and my friend JP were introducing this game to a new guy who another new guy moved to the neighborhood, and it was the same thing. We were like, "Oh, this is a role playing game, and you get to do what you want." And he was like, "Okay, I want to be a, a general, and I want to like you know command this army." You know, I think there's a way in which you can say it's it, you know there are some rules, and you have to start out low and sort of start as a newbie and work your way through it, but. The other possibility is um, uh, other kinds of role playing games that aren't set up quite that way. You know, where you can be someone a little more powerful, maybe like the, some of the Marvel superhero ones, or I don't know. Maybe someone else has a better answer for that question than I do. I feel like I'm not doing this justice here. Play in nominate. Play in nominate instead of like whatever. Just change systems where you can be a god. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Uh, who else? In the back, yeah. I was just going to say the thing that helped me the most when I was starting to say play D and D is that my husband, who got me into it, handed me the the class books, and I just read through it, mm. and that's how I figured out what I wanted to do. So maybe maybe have them just look through the books and pick out what they want to be. Right. Yeah, I think the most important thing is to get people involved in their character and coming up with something interesting about the character. I mean, you can, of course, teach them the mechanics just by giving them a pre-generated, you know, thing. I can say, well, let's just goof around to get it and your hand picture sort of feet wet into the, the way it works. But uh, I, as someone who's come back to the game after having not played for 25 years, I forgot so many of the rules and all that stuff that I was very obsessed about and felt very particular about as a teenager. I didn't care about it anymore in terms of the rules, really. So the way we play is a much more story-based, you know, when we have to roll dice, we will, but it's, it's really more about character and plot and stuff like that. Yeah. You said you were going to come back and tell why you stopped playing. Why I stopped? Yeah, I don't know exactly because I don't think that I consciously decided, but I will say I'm embarrassed to admit that I did. So the question is about why I stopped playing D&D. &D. And I think that unfortunately, because I was so insecure about myself and about my own place, I think I secretly felt like I wanted to do something that was cooler and I knew that D&D wasn't really cool, even though it was, it was my entire world in a weird way, that when I went away to college, I don't know how much, as a 17-year-old kid, I really thought this through, but I think I decided this is going to be something I'm going to do without D&D, &D, I'm going to put it aside. I don't know that I was necessarily ashamed of it or I was worried about what people would think about it. I just thought, you know, maybe I'm going to just go to college and see what happens. And I regret it because it was such a huge part of my life. And I love the game so much, so there's no reason why I shouldn't have continued to play. And there are plenty of people, you know, in the Pioneer Valley, who out in New Hampshire College, who played D&D, &D, and I could have Continued, so it was. It was probably uh, a not conscious decision, but I would still kind of keep my uh, interest in it. I would check in to see what new editions of the games had come out. The thing that really started to turn me around was when the Lord of the Rings movies came out in 2001. I was living in France at the time, and they came out, and I, I was really very interested in them. I thought I didn't think I really was into fantasy anymore, but I found out that I really was, and that was the kind of the gateway drug that got me in a way. <laughs> Back into into thinking about this stuff again. So, yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, 